I think it's extremely uh, significant to me at any rate that um, you thought you knew something very well until you encountered Iqbal's view of it and then you realized how, um, I won't say exactly conventional, but how there are so many things you didn't think about which he introduced you to. And I can do this best by reading you one more letter by <laughs> but no, which bears on a contemporary issue, which is the question of Kosovo. I had uh, leapt into print in late March about Kosovo and the NATO intervention, and in his rather gentle way, he wanted to indicate to me that I think that I had uh, missed a few things, which I'm sure I had. Well, I knew I had. So here's what he said. Son of Palestine, moon over Jerusalem, <laughs> light of the Semites, refuge of the world, shadow of the Lord on earth. Uh, <laughs> a, hum a humble particle of dust offers salutations from down under your expensively dressed and glorious feet <laughs> and welcomes you back to the land of bombs and missiles, cold milk and canned honey. With deep interest and in humble submission, I had read your stirring thoughts in Dawn, which is the newspaper that he had introduced me to where I still write in Pakistan. I read your stirring thoughts in Dawn of Pakistan on the plight of Kosovo and the nefarious imperial intervention therein to advance its own purposes. Since in your wisdom and forbearance, you have forsaken your abject Batman, this glorious essay, is the one, yours in other words, the one I wrote, is the one august sign I have of your return to the not so glorious belly of the beast. I enclose an abject effort on the subject, which unfortunately was written and dispatched before I could enlighten my dusty self and decorate my humble effort with a quotation or two from your brilliant observations. This, this is Iqbal at his ironic best. As always, with due respect and the humblest of submission, I remain Iqbal of no consequence. <laughs> and, and he enclosed his article, which uh, taught me a lot. Uh, so his way of, of dealing with the subject, uh, particularly the whole question of liberation and a vision of justice for the future, was really, I think it's no exaggeration to say, quite unique. It was, there was nobody else I have ever met in, in many years of meeting people who are experts on politics, especially from the third world, which is what you were sort of born with, um, than Iqbal. Um, and I've isolated five or six things that I think are, were particular to his type of analysis with respect to, to the subject that, and the cause that engaged us both uh, very passionately and in a very deep way. Um, I don't really know uh, the origins of Iqbal's interest in Palestine, when it began and why it began. Uh, but it was through Iqbal that I first learned of the interest of Palestine to people in the third world and the subcontinent, something of course we as insular Arabs never really thought about because we thought we think we're the center of the world and we have very little awareness of what others think of us, and not only others, but others who are not Western. And Iqbal, as you all know, had a kind of natural dignity to him, uh, which uh, allowed him never to kowtow to the white man, and yet to treat everyone with the same kind of respect and uh, consideration. And I think for many of the Arabs to whom I introduced Iqbal on his numerous visits to Beirut and uh, Tunis and the West Bank and uh, Gaza, uh, were, all, were immediately taken with his manner, which was um, uh, extremely um, deferential uh, because he felt he, when he was talking with Palestinians, he was talking with people who were genuinely suffering, although many of them weren't. But, um, uh, uh, I mean, they embodied something which was important to him, uh, an experience of oppression and uh, suffering, and that they embodied also the struggle uh, for liberation. And everyone was also struck with the patience with which he talked to people. Uh, he didn't, uh, he didn't uh, try to give lectures, <clears throat> although, as you all know, he wasn't shy about giving his opinion, sometimes at very great length. But um, he somehow managed to do it <clears throat> in, in just the right uh, tone and with just the right amount. 
Um, and this, I think, has marked everyone who met Iqbal, and that's still the case today since his death. Uh, I still hear from friends uh, literally all over the Arab world who say, you know, how sorry they are and how uh, saddened they were in, in all sorts of ways about Iqbal's uh, passing. Well, the first thing that uh, impressed me uh, about Iqbal's um, analysis of the liberation struggle for Palestine was his fearlessness. Uh, it, it's been alluded to many times, but, as, but I'll say it again, that everyone knows that in many respects, for all kinds of reasons which are not worth going into, uh, Palestine is the one subject that everyone who is, has very good positions on everything else um, drives away or keep, makes people keep silent. Iqbal had a way, nevertheless, of being quite fearless about this, and he taught me in particular that and I don't, I don't want to just leave it at that to say fearless, because um, uh, it, it had a very special uh, range, I think, um, and I want to talk about that. But he did it in such a way which I tried to learn from him, but alas, never could, which is to do it in a non-threatening way, in other words, to talk to people, because he understood all sides of the equation. This is something quite rare. Most people are inured uh, to the opponent and to really treat them in a kind of uh, blanket way and uh, you know say you know talk about the other as a kind of monolithic person but I think what Iqbal had was uh, a sense of compassion uh, both for of course the victim of oppression and even for the person who's doing the oppression uh, and this was quite I thought unique especially in America since many Jews identify with Israel Iqbal had a special way uh, of talking to American Jews. I mean, of course, he, he had, had married an American Jew, as you all know, uh, and was really, it wasn't a problem for him, uh, as it might have been for, uh, for Arabs. But he taught us how to, um, to deal with it fearlessly and comfortably, if you, if you like, uh, with compassion and without uh, condescension. But the particular kind of fearlessness that I want to note, which is important for all of us, is the sense of the need, which was quite unique to Iqbal, of actually taking your, since he was so much opposed to violence, and he was not, I mean, he believed, of course, in uh, wars of national liberation, but violence for its own sake repelled him as did terrorism, as you know. But one of the things that uh, I thought was especially um, useful for an intellectual to learn from Iqbal was the need to take your talking your message, your, your cause, into the heart of the other side. I remember in May of 1992, I, just right after the Gulf War, uh, well, a, a year or so after the Gulf War, I was um, invited by the Central Command uh, of the U.S. military, which is in, of all places, Tampa, Florida, which is where, where General Schwarzkopf came from and uh, which had run the Gulf War effectively. And of course, the whole mentality of the imperial, I, when I told it to Iqbal, of course, he knew all about it, but I, it was new to me, that the US divides the world into commands. There's a central command, there's a European command, there's a Pacific command, there's a, it, at, like the Roman Empire. And we, as I was told by General Hoare when I was to, got down there finally, uh, we are responsible for the defense of the Horn of Africa, or m most of East Africa, Egypt, uh, the Gulf, um, uh, right to the, to the edge of Pakistan, Turkey, and so on and so forth. And I, I thought it was quite unusual to hear that kind of language spoken so openly, uh, that we are responsible for the defense. Of course, I said defense again. For, I mean, who are you <laughs> You, who are you defending for what, more or less, was my question, but I couldn't get it out. But anyway, I hesitated, I hesitated a great deal because I knew that the audience would be entirely made up, as indeed it was when I got there, of five or six hundred people, all of them at the lowest level, colonels uh, in all the services, and hundred, what seemed to me like an un uncountable number of intelligence people, all of whom I considered my enemies. Uh, um, and Iqbal said, no, no, you, you really, th those are the people you have to talk to. Uh, and you can't shy away from them and just say, well, they're helpless because they're on the other side. Because you can always, uh, not you personally, but one can, always try to persuade. And that's really the, perhaps the most powerful weapon uh, that we have, uh, you know, speaking of weapons of the weak. Um, and it, indeed, I went and I learned that and I've applied it since then, again, with Iqbal's encouragement to talking to Israelis, which is, I think, very important. 
to do, in, in spite of the fact that in the Arab world there is this whole thing about not talking to Israelis. I, by that, I don't mean having private seminars. I mean actually going to Israeli institutions and talking there. And of course, above all, and this is the central command of uh, Iqbal, is never to compromise when you're doing that. In fact, to be as stern as you possibly can with what you say. In other words, don't be intimidated by the fact that you're in the heart of the enemy, but say it uh, with as much eloquence and passion as you can, uh, precisely to those people who really ought to hear what you have to say. So this kind of fearlessness and courage, I think, are quite unique, were quite unique to Iqbal. Second, Iqbal, as somebody who had spent most of his life, as far as one could gather, um, living amongst people who were struggling for liberation, parts of liberation movements from the Algerians on, he brought a particular type of analysis, which uh, was never what you expected. For example, because uh, uh, I don't want to take too much time, uh, Mariam gave me my watch here so as not to blather on too much, but um, uh, for example, he wanted, very, he wanted it very much known to Palestinians when he came either to Beirut, where I brought him in the late 70s, and introduced him to Arafat and members of the executive committee and the heads of all the services and so on and so forth, Palestinian services, and then again in Tunis after 1982 when the PLO was exiled and they were there. I take Iqbal. Um, I mean, he was so generous with his time. Uh, and we would go with some other people uh, and have these kind of seminars, uh, which he gave in Beirut and then again in, in, in Tunis. And they were always about the United States. I mean, he, he understood the necessity, which he explained to Palestinians, of knowledge. Uh, that you have to know what you're dealing with he didn't think of himself as an expert on Israel, but he felt correctly, obviously, that it was important to understand the workings of the United States from the point of view, not, you know, he wasn't giving a seminar, although of course he was, but from the point of view, not of an academic, um, of an academic uh, teacher, but rather as somebody who is on your side. He never let anyone forget that he was on their side. And then he would proceed to give an expose of the functioning institutions, the points at which we could, he always used the adjective, uh, the pronoun we. It's interesting. Nobody ever doubted that Iqbal was speaking for us, a great gift he had. It was, a, it was, of course, a rhetorical gift, but it was also, it was anchored in a kind of authenticity, which is very rare. He says, these are the kinds of things we need to do. We need to take advantage of. Uh, the academy, of the media, the churches. He, he was a great believer in the power of the churches. And it was interesting that Iqbal was one of the first in our movement to, uh, and indeed in all movements, to look at the constituency of conscience in this country, which most people, this may surprise you, many of you are from that constituency, perhaps all, but most people outside of, this country, uh, outside of this country, in the third world, and certainly in the Arab world, maybe in the subcontinent, have no idea exists in this country. They think it's all, you know, as they think Israel is all this, and Germany is all former Nazis, well, maybe it is, I don't know, but, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, having just spent a few weeks in Germany, I have some, uh, anyway. But he, he, he thought it's very important to understand in your analysis and in your knowledge what on the other side can be creatively, uh, creatively um, looked at and analyzed and attached oneself to. Uh, and I have to tell you, this is partly ap ap apocryphal, but it's, I think, really true. My, the first time I suspected that uh, the PLO was going to go the way it went, namely attach itself to Saddam Hussein and then go in the way it did at Oslo, was during a seminar, expose of Iqbal's, where we were sitting in, it was in the late 80s in Tunisia. We were sitting in Chairman Arafat's seminar room, and there were a lot of people there, including Chairman Arafat, who, who liked Iqbal a lot, had always treated him as a brother, you know, as a fellow Muslim and, uh, and as a, you know, a combatant. <laughs> And as he talked, Iqbal uh, got into more and more details about the United States and how crucial it was that we understand what was happening here at the time. And 
I was sitting near Arafat, and I noticed he took out a little notebook, which he always had like this, and he flattered a lot of people, including me, I have to tell you, into thinking that he was playing really, paying really close attention uh, as he scribbled things in the notebook as you were talking. And he did that with Iqbal until I realized that the notebook concealed uh, little letters to him about employees who wanted to go on vacation and people who wanted to repair their cars. He's, he was such a, he's such a control freak that everything is brought out of fat, even till today. And instead of paying attention to what Iqbal said, he was, he was doing his office business behind his little notebook. So I figured there was some you know, uh, skullduggery going on there. And I told Iqbal about it afterwards. He said, well, it doesn't really matter. You know, the important thing is to do what you think is right. And if they pay attention, good. If they don't, uh, it doesn't really it doesn't really much matter. Um, you've done what you can. He didn't have much use for them. He didn't have much use for leaders whom he thought weren't willing to take the risks and put themselves on the line, do the utmost, do more than the soldiers, basically. You have to do that, he explained to everyone who he met. And he would give examples from his own experience in Algeria and, and elsewhere and, and, uh, and, and, and throughout history, because he was such a great, um, uh, um, he was such a great, um, uh, student of history. Um, so I think the whole notion of creative analysis was central uh, and knowledge for the purpose of um, advancing your cause, really. I wouldn't call it instrumental knowledge, but I would say knowledge that had um, a, a particular kind of hu humanizing and humanistic end in the real sense of the word. I don't mean humanistic in the sense that you read great books and Homer and, 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 and Virgil and so on and so forth, and that's it but rather that you take from this knowledge some deeper human understanding as well as, if you like, institutional understanding and even military understanding of the society you're confronting, understanding that you have to, in the best Gramscian way, reach across to people who are in the other camp and try through your intelligence and through your analysis to bring them to your side. This is, I think, quite unique. And Palestinians who encountered this in Iqbal were, were always tremendously energized and inspired. Uh, third, fourthly, uh, the question of language. I, I, I've mentioned this often, I don't think enough attention has been paid to it. Iqbal, as you can see from these uh, funny letters that he wrote, was very interested in what language could do. Um, and he was also, in this respect, very careful in his use of language, and he would frequently take one of your words and add to it another word or substitute for a word. For example, you talk about uh, uh, as was the case in Lebanon when he came in the late 80s, uh, late 70s. This is a particularly important thing. And he was very impressed with the, note, with the use made of the slogan, armed struggle, kifah masallah. Of course, he knew Arabic, he knew what it meant, it means armed struggle. And he had gone to the south and examined, the, through Abu Jihad, who was the head military man in, the, in Fatah, actually, in the south. And he had spent several days, I, I, I didn't go with him, I, I'm, Unlike Iqbal, I'm not a very good traveler. Uh, he, he went down there, and then he wrote a two or three page report on them, which uh, effectively told the leadership how quickly they would be defeated by the, uh, by the Israelis in, uh, if there was an invasion, which there was two years or three years later. But that's not important uh, to, to my point now. The, <clears throat> the point is that the, the whole notion of armed struggle was uh, dismantled by Iqbal. And he tried to make them understand that it wasn't important just to say armed struggle and to use, as he used to call it, the macho symbolism of the gun, waving a gun around or firing a clashing cough in the air, which was very common in those days, but rather to transform armed struggle into, revolu uh, armed struggle into revolutionary struggle. In other words, you have to look at a particular component in the struggle and emphasize that. And by revolution, he would go on to say, I'm not, I don't mean something very... Uh, conventional and formulaic, but rather how to change the society, of course this stopped people, how to change the society from one which is based on violence, therefore totally undermining the notion of armed struggle, one which is based on violence, the one which is based on community, on, uh, on, on decent human relations, fairness and justice. It was always, he always pointed forwards towards a vision of justice and equality which improved the, actually improved the human lot. Very, I mean, no one, I mean, a lot of people would look at him with kind of uh, sort of 
disbelief. What is this man talking about? If you, you know, we want to kill, basically. And understand, well, I mean, of course, if you're suffering bombing and you've been dispossessed and you have no identity card and you're treated as an animal, the one thing you want to do is to sort of get vengeance. I mean, that's, of course, he understood that as well, by the way, in the transformation of Israel into a, a Sparta, that these are p people, as he often said, who had gone through a certain kind of suffering, but in the process, instead of alleviating only their suffering, they had produced another community of suffering. So this kind of analysis, which, uh, which depended very much upon the choice of words, and he, when he talked, you felt, uh, I'm not talking about his public uh, speeches, but talking with uh, p partisans, militants, there was a very careful rhetorical strategy which would get one in the end to a real vision, uh, which would be a transformation of the present into um, uh, the transformation of the present into a better state. It, it, in that respect, I think he was also uh, quite unique. The last point I want to make uh, is the undying search by Iqbal for what he called creativity. I mean, I, I think this is perhaps, if anything, will define for me, as his friend and student, um, his legacy. It is to look always, although it may be very hard to find, for the creative element uh, in human action, human activity, human thought, human knowledge. And one of his most powerful words of dismissal and and, and irremediable criticism is conventional. This is conventional analysis. This is a convent, I mean, this was, for example, his great, uh, uh, his great uh, critique of the PLO in Lebanon is it's that it had turned itself into a conventional army. And that if you are weak, the last thing you can resort to are conventional means. You can't afford it. Because if you want to try and be a, 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 an armed force, then you have to, as he once said to a group of Palestinians in Lebanon when I was president, we, I think we were in a camp, and he was talking with young militants who were, brand, you know, this was in the heady days of the uh, thing, uh, brandishing their guns and talking about the need for armed struggle and so on and so forth. He said, yes, but listen, if you're going to do that, you really have to have an answer you have to be able to respond to the Israeli Air Force, and there's no way you're going to be able to do that. I mean, these are, they're flying F-16s at 50,000 feet, bombing you from there, and there's nothing you can do. Uh, so the last thing you want to do is to resort to conventional means and to conventional thinking instead of trying through other means, through creative means, to get closer to the front and be able to fight for what is just and and uh, for what you think is right and for the restitution of your rights, in which, of course, Iqbal believed absolutely. And he was, for example, I'll, I'll give you some instances of some of the creative suggestions he made that were never taken up. In the 70s, after the Black September in uh, Jordan, when the PLO moved to Beirut, which is about the time I met him. I met him in 1970. Um, Around 1972 or 73, he came to me uh, with the following notion. He said, listen, what you people are fighting for is something that you cannot make the world understand by hijacking planes and blowing up buses and killing civilians. I understand it's necessary to draw attention and you are a forgotten people and so on. But what is it really about? So I say, well, it's about dispossession. He said, exactly. So. Why doesn't the PLO do the following? And I'm summarizing a very complicated uh, series of steps. And this was his idea. He said, why not plan a march on all sides, totally unarmed, led by the leaders of the PLO, from Beirut to the borders with Israel, from Amman to the borders with Israel, from Egypt in the south, since there are about 150,000 Palestinians there too, to the, and Syria, and to the borders with Israel, going with boats, uh, he says preferably, you know, cheap and, you know, small boats, unthreatening boats, via the sea, a massive march on Israel saying, we want to go home, without, uh, he said, of course it won't work, 
But at least, I mean, if you're going to do something dramatic, do something creative. Do something, you know, something that attracts the world's attention and underlines the plight rather than the savagery, the re revanchisme, and so on and so forth. That, that was one. Of course, some of us mooted it about, and of course we got absolutely nowhere with it, um, perhaps because, unlike Iqbal, we were stopped by what seemed to be the logistical problems. <laughs> but um, he, he continued with, with ideas like that, and the last one, which I, I will close with, which is, it seems to me, also the, the importance for him of creativity, is when uh, a year or two years ago, they started to build the settlement in what the Israelis call, uh, what we call Ras al-Amud, or Har Homa, which is one of the most outrageous settlements, because there's no, there's no, it's quite a distance outside of Jerusalem. It's between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, and it's, there's a forest involved, you know, cutting down trees and um, uh, building a, a totally unnecessary settlement, except, of course, during the Netanyahu period, it was a necessary to assert presence and power. And Iqbal, who appreciated more than most people and, and, and delighted in the methods of the intifada, communities, people working together, men and women, equality between men and women is very important to him in these struggles. But at that time, he said to me, listen, the, you must tell Arafat. I said, well, I can't talk to Arafat. I've stopped talking to him. He said, well, write about it. And I, in fact, did. I, I, I owe one of my better columns to this idea of Iqbal's, that once again, he said, what they should do is they should lead a march on the settlements and say openly with banners, we want to live with you, but we want to fight your stones and bricks. Which was, of course, again, get the creative way of getting to the heart of the issue, which is the continued dispossession by Israelis of Palestinian land. And to do it in a non-threatening way, without arms, just a lot of people, ordinary people, led by their leaders in the front, not in the back, sitting in some room and saying, well, you do that and you do that, and I'll have another cup of coffee. But rather to lead a, a march in this way, organize, he always thought of the extensions of this, in such a way that there would be a press conference in New York, there would be a press conference in, in, uh, in, in Ramallah or wherever, in various places, so that there would be a coordinated strategy to use the knowledge of this unusual event to magnify and uh, create a new dimension to the struggle. Of course, that was never acted on, of course, and he had to live through, as so many of us do, the irony that m all of the Israeli settlements today on the West Bank and Gaza are being built by Palestinian labor. <laughs> Most people don't know this, but it was then that we started to talk about a need to organize the laborers, uh, which of course uh, has never been done. But these are the lessons, uh, uh, rather the legacy of Iqbal, and the living lessons, I think, that his mode in, as it were, battle, was very much like his mode in the classroom. Not to look at a situation conventionally, to read it and just memorize it and come back with the, you know, armed struggle or whatever the phrase is, you know, you've taken from one place and used it in another, but rather study the situation in all of its complexity and wholeness, involving also the situation of the other side, with compassion, creativity, and a kind of inventiveness that always looked towards the future, towards providing, an, uh, providing a better world in which these very same people would be able to live together in a different, in a different relationship. After Iqbal died, I, like many people who loved him, realized that I had taken him so much for granted. He was such an encompassing presence. He would give you little nuggets of his life and you wouldn't inquire further because you thought there's always time with Iqbal. That was the greatest gift he offered was the fact that with him you were always in the present and you always felt you had more time. So I started looking to try and try and find out more because you thought there's always time with Iqbal. That was the greatest gift he offered was the fact that with him you were always in the present and you always felt you had more time. <laughs> 
So I started looking to try and try and find out more about those nuggets, try and find out where actually was the detail, what happened when and how. Uh, stupid search, of course, but one way in which one deals with loss. Well, I discovered, um, along with many other people, that I had imagined Iqbal, just as so many other people had imagined him. And to me, that was actually a very empowering understanding because I realized that one of the greatest gifts he gave to all of us was that he allowed us to imagine him. I also realized that any person who does that pays an enormous cost. Iqbal never once said to me, you know, we always, with, between friends, you always talk about each other and you say, well, this is what you're like. He never ever said to me, and I don't think he said to most of his friends, no, I'm not like this. He never brought himself into the picture in that kind of way. And I think that, that the human sacrifice that you make in order to allow people to imagine you, that was something that I learned only after Iqbal's death. It was the most extraordinary thing, what he did for all of us. Um, now, Given that, I also then realized what remarkable consistency there was in this man. Um, one of the things I started looking at was I, I thought he had spoken in many ways about Algeria, and I thought Algeria had been perhaps the great formative experience of his life after the partition of India. Algeria, in an odd way, had been his way of taking the fight for India and Pakistan, which had been such a dreadful experience for him. Algeria was his way of taking that fight somewhere else in a more positive way, somewhere where he could, he could bring his legacy of loss into a legacy of creation. Um, so I thought, let me find out. So I took all his books on Algeria, and I flicked and I flicked and I flicked, and of course I couldn't find very much out. What I did find out, however, which I thought was absolutely fascinating, was that people like Belkas and Krim and the others, when they were in prison, were reading the works of Ibn Khaldun. <laughs> this to me was, I thought, all right, now, 40 years later, this man wants to name a university after Ibn Khaldun. Here's the consistency of a life that you, that you keep in your head. Um, there were two, two elements I then, once I started thinking about this, there were two elements that were absolutely unchanging in his life, in his thought, and in his um, commitment. One was uh, the struggle against colonialism in every which form, which he took to the end with Kosovo when he talked about the NATO intervention as a failed intervention because the West was not willing to commit ground troops to protect people and see that ethnic cleansing did not occur. Um, the, other, the other, which is an insight I owe to Rasha Salti, whom you will be hearing later, is that Iqbal was a refugee. And in all his campaigns, it was, it was the refugee that his commit, uh, towards whom his commitment was deepest. These were the two, if you like, poles of every, every campaign, every activity that he engaged in, every commitment that he took on. Um, starting to think about that, I thought, let me, you know, let me think a little further and, and see where did these two influences come into his life? Why was it that these were so crucial to him? Um, I, I started thinking about his family. Um, there are people here who, of course, could tell you very much more than I can about this. But I realized that at least one of, of the great influences, uh, uh, or rather, one of these great strands of, of commitment in him actually came through his family. Um, his 
His parents were very, very unusual people. I think, as you know, his family was a, a large landowning family in East India in the state of Bihar, which we always think of as the possibly the most backward and most barbaric part of India. Um, it also happens to be one of the sweetest parts of India, <laughs> the most childlike, the most innocent. Um, anyway, his, his, uh, his grandfather uh, was, was a man who uh, w wasn't particularly well educated, not particularly political. Nevertheless, uh, uh, when uh, the British came to India, he was one of the people who wanted to fight in what uh, the British called the Indian Mutiny of 1857. A lot of Indian nationalists called the First War of Liberation. Uh, many of us simply say 1857. Uh, his father wanted to go fight in that uh, grandfather, and he was stopped by his relatives from doing so. Uh, that was a fairly conventional legacy, if you like, uh, within India for, for Indian Muslims, because naturally uh, the British conquest was also the Muslim loss. His parents transformed that into something that I found incredibly unusual, actually, they were, uh, they were people who came under, well, who were influenced by Indian nationalism in a very interesting way. Um, they were, of course, friends of all the Indian nationalists, but his mother in particular was influenced by Gandhi, which was not very usual or common in India. And uh, as many of you know, she actually sent Iqbal off as a young child, a uh, young boy, to spend a few months with Gandhi, which was an experience that he actually disliked intensely. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, um, his parents were influenced by Gandhi. They began on a land redistribution program with their own land uh, uh, at a time when very few people were doing this. Um, that, uh, that influence, I think, brought into Iqbal's life not only uh, uh, the concern for anti-colonialism and for fights against, struggles against colonialism, it also brought into his life an understanding of the importance of, uh, of, of always bringing yourself into the mainstream of the fight, what Edward has talked about. This was, I think, one of the great uh, uh, qualities that Gandhi brought into political movements of all time and everywhere in the world, was the fact that the individual matters, that the individual uh, has, to, has to reveal himself or herself as part of a movement. Um, and of course, the question of nonviolence too uh, came into came into this um, struggle in, in that kind of way. Um, now the Gandhian legacy was one thing that his mother left him with. Uh, you'll see her photograph, by the way, if you go to look at the exhibition. Uh, the other thing I think that was very important in Iqbal's life, uh, which came from his older brother, was the understanding of responsibility. Uh, you know, Iqbal always described himself as rather an old feudal person. He, al he was rather paternal in his attitudes towards everybody who came into his life. You came under his wing. He wanted to look after you. He wanted to care for you. Uh, at, at the base of that was the notion of um, obligations. Obligations to, the, to your dependents, obligations to society, and obligations uh, to your country. His brother was a, a, an early civil servant. This experience was rather brutally interrupted by first the Bihar uh, riots, which actually were the backdrop to the partition of India. They were, in fact, uh, the reason why Gandhi and Nehru agreed to the partition of India. Uh, very brutally interrupted, and Iqbal became a refugee. This is the second part of, of this, um, this story. Um, 
Whenever he talked about leaving India, I think that the one thing that came through very, very clearly was the sense of expulsion. He felt he had been expelled. His family felt they had been expelled. It was a very brutal form of expulsion because they had been part of the creators uh, of what was to eventually become independent India and Pakistan. They had spent their lives being a part of this process, generation after generation after generation. And then comes the moment of independence, and they are expelled. That sense uh, uh, of expulsion, I think, was what, w was what made him choose his causes. And I think when one looks at, at the things that Baal was involved in, the campaigns, the movements, the, um, there was a very specific and careful choice over there. What moved him was very special. Uh, it was always his greatest commitments were to groups that he felt were being expelled uh, because, because of the history of expansionism, colonialism, and imperialism. Hence Bosnia, hence Kosovo. Uh, one element uh, within that choice was that um, Iqbal was a man who, c considering what a very varied life he'd had and considering the history and the background he came from, he was a man who was exceptionally rooted in himself. The core and the center of Iqbal's identity was never in question. Um, most of us, uh, in the modern world have many identities and many conflicts within our identities. We don't know for certain, am I this, am I that, what is my uh, community, I have so many communities. For Iqbal that was not the case. He was a Muslim. He knew he was a Muslim, he cared especially about Muslim societies in the world. Uh, he was not a Muslim by virtue of religion, he was a Muslim by virtue of circumstance and by virtue of history. And that he taught me one very important lesson, which is that for most of us, who only have rather a short span to live, circumstance is what makes us. We don't have to question that. Circumstance is not a problem, you know? We are not people who have to look for some essence outside circumstance. This is what we are. And that is what he was. Um, I felt later very, very grateful, uh, not to Iqbal actually, but, um, but to the different worlds that gave him a place. And I think most grateful of all to the Arab world. Um, Iqbal's sense of being a Muslim Iqbal's sense of being able to change a world uh, had been so defeated when he was so young by the subcontinent. He really want, you know, he and his family had the dream of a plural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious and secular India. Well, we all had that dream. I still have it, by the way. Um, but since he had been expelled, from India, and then later he became a kind of voluntary exile from Pakistan for the bulk of his life. Um, he had the urge and the commitment to try and fulfill that dream somewhere else. And I think more than anything, he had the urge to somehow create a Muslim society which could be based on secularism, on cosmopolitanism, on the values of tolerance, pluralism. And I think that he found at least a spiritual home for that, for those values, in uh, first and foremost amongst Palestinians, but also amongst Lebanese, amongst uh, um, Tunisians, amongst Algerians, amongst Mo Moroccans. And that I think, in an odd way, when I think later about what was the most important thing, I think in a way it was that spiritual home that he found that was in a way the most important thing in his life. The greatest gift that came to him was from 
these people. Um, I think also that having had that gift, maybe that enabled him to be able to return to the subcontinent. Uh, first, of course, to Pakistan, where he hoped so very much to be able to make a difference. Indeed, so did we all. Uh, um, Iqbal in Pakistan was so widely respected. Politicians of every hue would ring him up at moments of choice or crisis to say, give me your advice. They would also constantly take his articles and turn them into their own speeches. <laughs> and I remember you know, once saying, actually, uh, most annoyingly of all, um, the cricketer Imran, Imran Khan took one of Iqbal's speeches and turned it into uh, uh, articles and turned it into a speech. And I said to Iqbal, for God's sake, I mean, don't you feel devalued when a character of this kind, this completely awful, ridiculous man, takes your ideas and puts them forward? <laughs> I said, no, no, I don't mind. I mean, I don't feel complimented by it, but I don't feel devalued. If he wants to do it, it's his. <laughs> um, the, well, uh, these, the return to the subcontinent, the hope that he would be able to make a difference, uh, the sense that the kind of difference he was making might not be the kind of difference he wanted, uh, it was a very difficult process. Um, in his last years, he, um, as Yogesh said, uh, began to spend more and more time in India. He, uh, as, as Edward uh, has said earlier, Iqbal was absolutely uh, passionately committed to undoing the partition of India. He was committed to opposing partition wherever he could find it. He believed uh, uh, very deeply that the problems of our individual countries could, would never be resolved as long as this partition lasted. He was much more optimistic than me. He believed this partition would, in fact, end, uh, and that the subcontinent would find another way of creating itself. Um, I think that it, it translated in an odd way into a kind of personal quest for him. It was certainly very, very moving to see his return to India, the return of the refugee. It was a very painful process for him. But it was, in an odd way, a very fulfilling process for him. Um, he made it, again, typical of Iqbal, he made it through people, through individual people, individual families, individual homes. The Basus uh, who are here are one such family through whom he made his return to India. Um, and my family was another. Uh, thinking about this, I actually was thinking to myself that it was my family, if you like, was the other to his family. These were Hindus who had been nationalists, who had also gone with Gandhi and Nehru, who had, in their way, been very influenced by Maulana Azad. And uh, for him to, to come back to the subcontinent through a family which was a counter-mirror image of his own history, of his own past, it was... It was uh, I, I don't know how I can describe it to you. It was a revelation to me. <laughs> and he had this capacity, as Edward has, has said, of revealing to you things that you sort of took for granted, that you didn't think about, that you didn't feel that you had to think about, and the odd chance remark or the odd chance way in which he would simply hold himself <laughs> would suddenly bring a new light into your, into your life. Um, some years ago, um, I remember, uh, well, I was speaking at a, 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 a women's conference, and I thought that for me, one of the formative experiences of feminism had been what I call the refractory gaze, the ability, the ability to take both old and new things and shake them in, in such a way that suddenly an entire new light emerges. Well, I have to say now that I think possibly even more than the feminism which influenced me, it was Iqbal who had this refractory ability, this ability to simply give you something 
that would leave you thinking for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs>